the study committee meeting to order at 6.57, and we'll just take care of some of the formalities that we need to do um, that we can get done before the forum. I doubt we have a lot of community members that are anxious to hear us discuss the minutes. So, so I'll call the meeting to order at 6.57. Okay. Um, are there any agenda revisions? Uh, are there any public comments or correspondence that are not related to Act 46 um, forum? Uh, possibly. And that. Uh, it was a town meeting comment I had uh, from an interested citizen, uh, um, an elderly citizen that commented that she didn't have access or a desire to use internet. So really when I was referencing a place to go to find out what Act 46 is doing, thinking how can we get this citizen who wants to know more about it, to know more about it, without giving her this binder, I guess, is the, was the question. And I, I was a little bit stumped. I know we had the, the handouts and stuff, and but it's a very slight overview. So I don't know if anybody has ideas. That was the comment that was brought to me from, from the person that they'd like to have paper copies of stuff. Okay, so I think it would be appropriate for us to refer that to the Communications Committee to begin to address. I think in general, as the study committee begins to make some concrete decisions and recommendations, um, we'll really have to be mindful of letting the community be aware of it. Okay. And could I have a um, motion to approve the minutes of March 9th, 2016? Can I get a second? Second. That's okay. Second? Second. Uh, discussion? Yeah, I have just a few little typos that you made, and then also that I wasn't present. So okay. They're just um, typo type things? Like you, 33, so you okay. are, are people comfortable not knowing the specific typos that we're going to adjust? Yes. Okay. Anything else? Yeah, they've been given to the clerk. So I, I found some, I should check with Lisa. Okay, let's hear, Lisa, can you let us know what the titles are? Well, oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> she wasn't present, so I changed that. Um, there was a misspelled word, a line was misspelled, so I changed that. U33, I changed to U32, and I think there was one more, but I can't remember. There was one more where it said um, the first page, all of the facts and what kind of model we use, and if you look at the title. Okay, um, page three, or page five. Um, page five, uh, Underwoods, even on the page, said um, the principles is misspelled. It should, uh, the second to last line should be principles. A-L-S. Thank you. Any other adjustments? They seem small, but I truly appreciate those of you that picked up the minor things. The more accurate our minutes can be, the better. All those in favor of approving the minutes of March 9th, 2016, signify by saying aye. Opposed? Abstentions? Here is abstaining. Okay. So thank you. That takes care of uh, section one. And now it's 701 or two. We can move into the Act 46 forum. Yep. If, if, if I'm going around, I think I've got everybody that 
I think I know most people by face and name, but if I haven't, you haven't signed in, and you're not a member of the committee, we'd just like to ask you to sign in. Yes. Yeah, girls. No, no, I'm Some of the slides will look at the same, but we'll go into uh, more detail. But I wanted to welcome everyone here. Thank you for coming. Um, as you heard earlier, we'll continue to be looking at multiple ways to reach the community and let them know what's going on. So um, I think I'm asking Matthew to come up for the next two slides. Maybe I can just sit here if everyone can see me. Okay. Uh, I am Matthew DeGroat uh, from Worcester and a member of the Act 46 uh, study committee. So Stephen has asked me to uh, take you through the most riveting part of the evening, which is the uh, introduction to Act 46 and the legal language in it. Um, I assume all of you are at least familiar with the idea of Act 46, um, or you wouldn't be here. Um, but just, you know, very briefly to give a kind of capsule overview, uh, this is a law that was passed in May of last year. Uh, it affects uh, education and governance in the state of Vermont, it, and it, uh, some people have suggested that it makes some of the most, uh, it suggests some of the most significant changes to education and governance in Vermont in decades. Uh, the law specifically requires that school districts um, either adopt a quote-unquote preferred governance model, and that word is in quotes for a reason, because that's the language used by the law and presumably is uh, preferred by the legislators. Um, but anyway, to adopt a preferred governance model is defined in the law, or to demonstrate that an alternative structure will meet uh, all of the goals of Act 46, uh, either to the same degree or better. And uh, there are five goals uh, listed in the law, and they are in bold text uh, on this uh, slide. So uh, there are three of them that um, basically deal with uh, student outcomes and student access to education, transparency and accountability. So the first is to provide substantial equity and the quality and variety of educational opportunities. Um, I'm not going to read all of them off the slide. Um, the second one deals with student outcomes, basically improving uh, student outcomes. The fourth deals with transparency and accountability. And then the other two uh, deal with cost issues. So the third, to maximize operational efficiencies. In other words, to look through this change in governance for opportunities uh, to be more flexible in our management uh, and sharing and transferring resources and in managing the operation of the, the schools. And then the last one is to deliver education at, at, at a cost that parents, voters, and taxpayers um, value. Which, is a, which can be interpreted many different ways, um, but that's the language in the, the bill. So the study committee uh, represents all five member towns of Washington Central Supervisory Union. So the board of each town had to vote separately uh, to form and to join uh, this committee, and all five of the, the member boards did that in the fall. Uh, and uh, the committee now meets uh, twice a month. Uh, there are also subcommittees, primarily one on communications, uh, which meet. Um, and the charge, which we'll look at in a second, asks uh, that the study committee provide a recommendation, a recommendation and a report uh, by June 30th of this year. So that's the timetable that we're on. Again, I'm not going to read every word uh, that's up there. This is the official charge uh, provided by the full board of the SU to the study committee. Um, but the main piece of it, uh, it starts on the second line with the word determine. So the, really the objective of the committee is to determine whether the formation of a union school district or another structure is advisable. So to make that recommendation, uh, whether we should form a union school district, which is basically the preferred model, as it's called in Act 46, a unified K through 12 education system with one school board and one budget for the entire system. 
Uh, or if there's an alternative model, and there are several options that have been discussed, uh, and another option, uh, not mentioned on here by name, but could be to do nothing, could be advised not to change the current structure. Um, but in any case, the um, study committee in its report will need to make clear why it has come to its decision. In other words, to justify uh, its recommendation um, based on the five goals of Act 46 and how it meets those, those goals. Um, so then that recommendation would go directly to the State Board of Education. If it's reviewed and approved there, then would come to the voters of the five towns in Washington and Washington Supervisory Union for their consideration and, and uh, uh, either approval or rejection. Um, so that's the basic overview of Act 46. Uh, there are a lot of details and complexities and nuances if you dig down into this law. If you have any burning questions, I'd be happy to try to answer them. Uh, but I have a feeling that a lot of your questions and maybe some of the thoughts may come out during the discussion. So um, seeing no frankly waving hands. Thanks, Matthew. And before we change to the next um, slide, the reason this slide was presented in the format that it's in, uh, Washington Central Supervisory Union, and that's where this um, slide came from, is maintaining an Act 46 uh, link on its site. It's very detailed um, agenda minutes. Any of the reports or presentations that have been made to the study committee are listed. It's got the link to all the ORCA recordings. Um, very extensive information. And I will point out, um, it's come out in several discussions. Um, uh, many people have recommended if you're going to watch anything in the ORCA presentation, the one on March 9th by the leadership team, um, people found very informative. And, um, very useful. The study committee found it very informative as well. So if you're going to watch anything, you know, it's near the very beginning of that presentation, you might find it um, valuable. Okay, so if you've been to a mini forum, you've seen this slide. We're going to go into more detail on the information that's included there. And I'm going to ask Diane if she can come up, come up and do the governance structures. Yeah. Okay. Um, Diane is our Act 46 um, consultant. Because of the structure we're in, we can take advantage of some resources. Um, many of you, I th um, quite a few people are familiar. But maybe you can just give a little intro of yourself before you get going. Sure. Okay, so my name is Diane Kirsten Glenn. I'm a school board member actually from Jericho and Chittenden East, who had uh, merged for the Mount Mansfield Modified Unified School District um, over a year ago, so we've been operating under that structure. And so I'm here helping to um, navigate and be a go between between the committee and the agency and to try to um, facilitate all the pieces that need to be completed to comply with Act 46. Um, on my spare time, which is actually my regular job, I'm a school nurse. Just thought I'd let you know. Um, so governance structures. One of the things that's really great about this committee is that they've actually examined what they're doing already. How does this, how does this SU work? What are the pieces of it that are working for um, finance, for education quality? all of those different pieces. But one of the ones that we also looked at was the actual governance structure. How are things aligned in this district? So if you look up at the top, you'll see that we have, this is a diagram of the governance structure plus lines of communication. It's not exactly chain of command, but lines of communication because some of the things go back and forth. So you can see at the top, you have all of your towns and the numbers inside of them are population based on the latest census. You can also see the blue blob that has an S is your superintendent over on the side. Each town is connected to a board, which is its local elementary school board, and then there's the U32 board. And then underneath that are the principals. And then there's the Washington Central, the full board, which you guys are part of, plus the executive committee. 
And all the lines in between are the different ways that each group is connecting to the others. One of the things that comes up when you have elementary boards is that there is a tendency to have the principal and the board be doing a lot of that talking directly to each other. But the actual boss of the principals is the superintendent. So it does set up an interesting dynamic on that level. Do you have any questions about what you're looking at? Yes? Yes. The executive committee, which exists to handle centrally shared services, transportation, human resources, your finance officer, um, anything that would have to do with some, an employee had a work-related incident, had to fill out forms with the insurance, um, liability, all of those things tend to be all in one place. Part of that means that there is a budget um, item that comes from that that is usually buried into the local budgets. In other words, there's an assessment from that. So, and this is really common through all SUs throughout the state. So when the individual board goes to cut their budget, they usually can't cut anything that's from that central part that's assessed to them. That part is the part that's kind of not transparent and is not as accountable to the voters in terms of a budget item because it is placed in that area. That budget is approved there. Um, special education is under that area as well. Anything else that you can see there? So you, get a, you have a total of 32 board members at your Washington Central SU board, um, five each for the, for the schools, and then seven for U32. It does make it um, interesting in making decisions with all the different places things have to go. So the preferred structure that Act 46 is talking about is a single board that contains committees, single budget, and all of the towns above would come into that board and those committees, do their work, direct the superintendent, who then directs and manages the educational leadership and delivering the educational programs to the, to the students. That is the structure that um, they're envisioning and that most of the um, votes that have already come up, um, to pass, as in Central, Virgins, um, Franklin, this is the structure they've adopted. <coughs> Do you have any questions about this? Board representation would be proportional based on population. Okay. So there's been some talk about what would happen if Montpelier and or Roxbury were included into the mix. And so I wanted to give you sort of a graphic so you could see what would happen if those two communities were also added into a single board structure. Keeping in mind that um, you can only have a maximum of 18 board members on a board in, in Vermont. The populations are listed there. Do you have any questions about this one? So 18 board, is that in standard? It is. Depending on population or just the board? That's a maximum you can have. You can have less. Okay. So this is just a little bit to um, explain that once. Oh, yes. Is there any uh, diagrams on the other types of configurations that we talked about? They're going to come. Side by side? Yeah, they're going to come. Well, not side by side. But what I was going to try to say is that if you wanted to do multiple board governance, models. You know, the next two slides I'm going to show you are visuals to describe those. But those multiple board models, which mean you continue to keep your supervisory union and have other boards in them, are listed in the law as actually under alternative models. They can be called second choicers, option B. So what happened like for Chitnities is that we wanted to have a single board, single budget, but we made a plan B, as it were, so that if one town did not want to join, we could do the modified. So that was written into the articles. And as the vote turned out, we ended up with the modified. So it was a second choice option. 
What you can't do for the way we've been looking at this SU is to have those multiple board options be a first choice unless you want to qualify under alternatives. Does that make sense? For those of you who are in the know, I know some of this may sound a little strange, but let's take a look at that um, in terms of the depictions of them. So this is the kind of system that we have in Chittenden East because we tried, we had a vote that wanted all of our, all of our communities together with one board, one budget, one community said they did not want to join. And so what you can see happens is that the other four towns all are a part of one board and all are doing their, their thing. The individual K through six in your case board would also be talking to the superintendent, would also be talking to their principal, and then it would have to be another board created to handle those shared services. Now the shared services we talked about in the executive committee before would all be rolled into that one board. They would be doing all of the work all in one place. So when it comes time to talk about special ed, it's not happening in a different place. It's all happening in the same place. But once you have multiple boards, you still have to have your SU model. And so you have a little more complexity, but not as much as the first slide. This is a depiction of the layered model as, as I had read it from our, our um, algorithms, our formulas on how to figure it out. There is some debate on how this will end up in terms of a model. So I wanted you to just look at it with caution because they're not sure that this one is going to be eligible for some of the um, transition funding or tax incentives, which are part of the bill that you may have heard about. And that's another thing that's really important to remember because if for some reason you choose something that doesn't come with transition funding, I can tell you that Chittenden East has used their transition funding and needed to use it for legal fees, for communication, for plans and developing how we would move um, like our, our uh, alternative program into one of our schools, designs, if you needed any architectural work. So it's been really a helpful thing. But if you go to the point where you are choosing a model that does not come with any incentives or transition funding, it's a little harder. Does this model now come with transition funding? Or is it out, out of the loop on it? When I had the discussion with the Agency of Education, what they said to me was, I talked about this model, and they said, well, we were really envisioning that as happening if one of the towns didn't want to join. And I said, well, that doesn't make sense to me because then you're going to have four, I mean, you're going to have even another board because you'll have, it's like a modified with a layered in between, which, which added another layer of complexity. So I said to them that this is how I saw it. And they said, well, we will be changing the language. We will make that clearer because it wasn't clear. It was said in two different ways in two different places. So I'm getting clarification on that, but this would not be a primary structure to go for unless you wanted to come in under an alternative structure. So that was the, the diagram of the um, various governance structures that I have for you at this point. Are there any questions about any pieces of this? Yes. What is kind of envisioned in terms of routine communication between the schools and the principals? It looks like that looks like the superintendent is kind of a go-between. But is that just intended as a as a um, you know are those arrows about communication or about actual power? Right, and I'm keeping them as lines of communication because if we go back to the single board one, it was like the second one. This is how the actual chain of command is supposed to work as envisioned by Vermont School Boards Association, as envisioned by best practices throughout the country. That the towns create a board, or town, depending on where you are, that directs the superintendent, that sets the policies, et cetera, for the entire group, and that the superintendent 
then directs the principles in terms of a chain of command. With the first one, it just gets really muddy because of the way we've done things in Vermont. And I think that that's just because of the history of creating supervisory unions, which kind of grew up after there were already school boards. And, and I think that our governance structure and our finance structure just kind of like sort of limped along. It wasn't like it was a thoughtful process to get anywhere. It was always changing depending on what was happening in education and in towns. So does it, does it envision school board meetings no longer having principals present or having discretion on the school board? Yes, Stephen wants to talk to that. So um, that, that question and discussion is actually outside of Act 46. Statute, we do not operate according to statute. According to statute, the principals work for the superintendent. We've operated differently. It's just how we've operated. I'm not trying to make a judgment on it. That's why I'm coming in, because it's perhaps a little unfair to ask someone from outside our district, or outside our issue. So that's tended to be how we've operated. Hire Superintendent hires and fires principals according to statute. With this model, how many seats does each town have? Do you want to? That's, it's, that's it's a great question. Yeah, it's proportional. There are a couple of ways to do the proportional, and there's a, a whole set of stuff, but the most direct way would be, and it would be very easy to look at this, is to go as to one per 1,000. No matter how small the smallest district is, they always have to have one seat at the table. That's how every other vote, you know, articles of agreement have gone. Um, and the only difference was with Essex Westford, where they had two people at the table, but they have like half votes. It's, but they're not real happy about that. In terms, it just makes things messier. And then if Montpelier's in, what are the numbers? Would you, you would like to see that? That's, yeah. There you go. So then you have to figure out how you would do that. That would be a big discussion, I'm sure. Yeah? So before you said one for 1,000, Worcester has about, about 1,000. East Montpelier has 2,500. Mm -hmm. Do they get two or do they get That's three? a tough one. That would be something that would be an, an article discussion in the Act 46 committee. And we would go to legal for that. We would make sure that the legal, um, your legal representative, your lawyer, was there to make sure it absolutely met the statute of the law. Yes? Isn't it, forgive me if you already said this, but isn't it also an option to have, because so for example, without exceeding the maximum number of board members allowed by statute, Worcester could have two seats with weighted their votes would be weighted at half, one half. Yes, that's what Westford did for Essex. So, uh, so the ratios could be worked out that way as well. More voices at the table, but still, strictly speaking, meeting the recognition requirements. Yes, under legal advice, I would do that. Yeah. We would have that discussion. Are there any other questions about the? diagrams here. Any particular one you want to see again? The current one we're in at all? Okay. So when you say, Dan, when you talk about this, I mean, I think Larry made a point of saying lines of power versus lines of communication. So these diagrams really cut out the town from communication with the principal by your own diagram. Um, um, I'm sure you're not intending to do that. Um, because you know, the, the towns communicate with the principals of their school. Um, and, so, and parents do too, right. all the time. Right, so right. those lines are power lines or communication lines? In this particular one, the reason, only reason why the one in the beginning said lines of communication was because it's blurry. And in this particular one, this is, this is lines of delegation, I guess I would say. You could call it power if you wish, but delegation. So the board is the boss of the superintendent. The superintendent is the boss, effectively, of the principals. But then again, we're getting into that subject again that is outside of that. 
So what I think, um, if what you're getting at is how to ensure towns and communities have as much voice now with their principal um, in another model, that's something for discussion, how that would happen. How they would have that voice? Yeah. We have no problem having that voice right now in our schools. Nothing has changed in Chittenden East. Do you want me to continue? From the experience. No, from oh, your okay. experience of information. So from my experience, do you want to know if they're in present at the board meetings? Well, some what, are and some are. I don't, think we've, I don't think we've noticed any difference. I don't think we've noticed any difference. We still have community coming. We still have community talking to us. We still have our principals present at meetings. Some of them are present at some meetings all the time, and some will rotate through, especially the elementary principals. Depends on the topic that we're discussing. So, uh, Ruben, and then back. Yeah. So one of the things that I think is important to remember is that Act 46 is about governance and it's not about parental interaction or student interaction with the principal, right? So uh, when a, a child has trouble and needs to go to the principal's office, certainly the board is going to be involved. That, that's clearly an operational um, situation at the school. And so what this chart is really about is policy and governance and how the the direction of the school and the, uh, from a very high level sort of management perspective, the uh, information flows and the, uh, the direction of the school flows. Not, I mean, the school boards are not involved in, and we shouldn't be, we're policy and governance. Uh, we're not involved in the day-to-day -day operations of the school. That's absolutely correct. I'm wondering if you have hired a new principal in that district and how that might have changed and just how that might look for communities in, in, in hiring. So in hiring a principal, there would be a committee that would give input to the superintendent and that would include parents, teachers, and board members. That's how we've always done it. That's how we did it even beforehand. So there would be and you know, definitely constituents that would get to interview um, the final candidates and have some say. Would all those be from the town that's hiring that principal, or would it be from all of these towns? So we haven't had that opportunity, but I have a feeling it would be from the direct community. I don't see why it wouldn't because um, the most important thing school boards do is, to, in my mind, is have great administrators, and hiring someone who's going to set the tone for the school is, is critical. Most of them 
major, profound, and most interesting decisions were made in the interplay between parents, teachers, and that administrator in school. So if they wanted to have more farm to school, if they wanted to have a garden, if they wanted to have um, you know, a fundraiser for whatever, those kinds of things all were coming from the ground up. And each school continues to have its own unique flavor. We've rotated our meetings, and every one of them is different. Everyone um, has just enough little twist that's their own, and that's their continues to be their purview. Is your per pupil spending identical across your elementary school or across your schools at the same level? Like we have more than one building? Not I mean, our tax, well, tax rate or per pupil spending. So I would have to go back and take a look at what changes have been made because of the way the tax um, sort of discounts worked. Everyone is being brought gradually to a similar rate. But in terms of how much it costs individually at each school, we actually, I don't even remember that being brought up this year in the merge vote. I think that Huntington has their separate one, but we have a different number. We have a different number average across, so it's slightly higher for the high school because of the waiting for that. But it was not, in, we didn't get it in between each school this year as a merge system. So you don't look at that at all? Like there's no consideration of the efficiency of each building? No, it's just on the town taxing rate. Um, no, we are all together for that piece. I don't really recall that being a big feature of our budget presentation. So then you roll that for people spending up and then apply that evenly across the town and I understand there's some mechanism in place to bring the town rates closer. Right, and I think the best way to explain it would be for me to look at or show to you our budget presentation, which we had to give to the voters to explain all that to, but I do not have that in the top of my head. Yeah, this goes back to the hiring issues. I mean, I disagree with you wholeheartedly, having been involved with several principal hirings and staff hirings. It would have gone very differently if local appointed members from local boards had not been on those committees. And I have great concern that the people that will get appointed to things like that by the hierarchy are really being appointed because they will be yes men, because they are going to select certain people that are going to fit these certain criteria, not really the needs of the community. And the community in this model, I mean, the thing that really bothers me the most is we have these great little triangles, but the people in the communities pay the bills for this, and they own these schools. They, and they are not, they're losing accountability. Right now, the local school boards are accountable to that. People don't always pay attention, but I'll tell you, in bad times, they do. When I was on my school board days, we had bad times. We had very angry people that we had to you know, account for. And this model just does not allow that. It's washed out. There is nobody that the townspeople of Callis or Worcester or Middlesex can ultimately go to and really have the authority to say no. <clears throat> it, I'm really concerned with this model. Australian ballot is is going to really hurt us in this. And I am not confident that I think our quality is going to go down and our oversight is going to go down. We're going to see negative results, just as has happened in Maine. And probably at least 42 to 50 percent of the schools are consolidating. You know, that's proven. It's out there today. I give it to you. But you know, I, I haven't, I'm not seeing this conversation where we're going to get this piece of accountability, local accountability to the local people who are paying the bills. They work for The superintendent works for the people in these towns. The principals work for the people in these towns. And we're walking away. We're, it's, we're going to be we're beginning to flip that to the bureaucracy really controlling the people. And I think I am, let me, let me we to disagree. Yeah. I, 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 that it's a valid discussion that needs to be addressed. This is not the point in the presentation to do it. This is a discussion that needs to happen within the study committee 
and within the communities. I, I don't want to put his feedback. It's public feedback. No, I understand, and, and we hear the feedback, but I just want to, some of this discussion is study committee discussion that needs to occur, and that's, we're hearing it. And well, I want the public to hear this. Yeah. I'm at the study committee meetings also, yeah. but this is public, because you asked for a public ballot. Was there someone else that had a comment? I had a question. Yeah. <clears throat> I wondered if you've been in this long enough to have seen if it's making a difference on saving money. Which yes. it didn't sound like this, the, um, the study that had done done by the legislature didn't sound like it was going to save money to go with this model. But it's being pushed now, it seems to me, as if it is going to save money. And I just wanted to address that. Also to address the differences between Palace having the um, money saved ahead for our school and some of the other towns that haven't. So I can address the part about how Chittenden East has handled money saving. And the interesting thing about it is that you don't know all the efficiencies you can make until you find out you have a structure that allows you that flexibility to find them. But right now, we were able to, um, we can document $166,646 right now. We're expected to, projected to save over 300000 However, projected savings, I don't like to talk about because I think a lot of people get a little wiggly about you know promising the moon. So we have made some savings. Our budget increased by 0.62% for all of those schools. We were able to save enough with all the efficiencies that we made so that a big project we had been planning to do, which was to repave and redirect traffic flow between two schools that share a sim similar campus at $300,000, does not need to go out to bond. We were able to find the money within our budget. Otherwise, that would have had to go out to bond. So we're still uncovering all these different efficiencies and all these different ways of saving money as we go along. We were able to avoid hiring extra teachers because we offered school choice for kindergarten classes in the north end between three schools so that we got optimal class sizes of 14 in each school with parents choosing to go three miles down the road further with centralized busing. It didn't, wasn't going to make a difference. So we don't even know where these savings will take us, but those are some of the ones that we have so far. What's They're not the, millions of dollars. What's the percentage on that? The like $100,000 is a, what kind of percent? It would be a drop in the bucket. I don't even know. I'm sure it's considered a drop in the bucket, but it's the beginning of the start in terms of the savings. But it wasn't why we got into it particularly. It was for the flexibility. What are your towns? We are Jericho, Underhill. We don't have Underhill ID anymore. Uh, Richmond, Bolton, Huntington is not part of the merged group. Um, so we don't have you, yeah, Underhill. Richmond, yeah, Jericho, Underhill, Richmond, Bolton, Huntington. So those are the towns. I'm not sure where. Next. Uh, do some of those schools have programs like Spanish that other schools don't have? Or have you seen that get cut when you merge? Actually, it was unequal um, already because that was one of the programs that was on the chopping block right off. So they were whittling away at their foreign language programs. And now what we're going to do is we have a, a proposal out for a language immersion program, which would be a program that we would share between all the schools who are in the merge district, but not with Huntington because they're not part of it at this point. So we might do a pilot, we're just talking about it now, but it's a possibility, at least it's out there. So we have to look at our strategic plan, figure out where our priorities are in terms of um, fully bringing forth our part about the global citizen and, and what they need for um, working in a larger world, whether or not the language part, how we're doing already, and then how a language immersion program might be able to help and how we can budget the money for that so that might end up being an extra expense. But there's no conversation about cutting. We have not had to cut anything. We have, had, we have been able to decrease staff through natural retirement and attrition. So we're not talking about cutting programs.
as a board member, we've all been through brutal budgeting seasons. I'm wondering, as a board member, what your experience with um, the budgeting process has been uh, in this new moment. In the new um, entity, it's been um, very smooth, very easy. Um, Mansfield um, and a couple of other um, budgets went down several years ago before we merged. So we were having difficulties at that time. But we had absolutely no difficulty in coming up with the budget. Um, presenting the flyer, I have a copy of the flyer here today so you can see how they documented the savings and the projected savings and what happened to the tax rates. And I think that might have some of the more data that you were talking about. Um, so it went pretty smooth. And the budget passed. We've been doing Australian. Some of the towns were already doing Australian. Um, we had good turnout, and it passed by a wide margin. I have to admit, I wasn't as prepared to talk about Chittenden East today. I was supposed to just talk about the little triangles and hexagons. No, this is, it's great to hear you know, a so real, sorry, real life model. Yeah, sorry if I don't have all the data at my fingertips, because I wasn't ready for that. Uh, just a follow-up to the last question. Um, what was the experience in terms of kind of weighing the needs of the different schools now that you're one, one budget committee or, or one, one board talking about all the schools' needs? And, and was there some playing, you know, one school off of another versus another, or feeling like, well, this one's going to now, you know, not get as much as it might have gotten because it's the small one on the block, you know, that kind of dynamic? No, and see, that's the suspicion that people have about, uh, about how board members will have a motivation or a, an agenda. And that isn't at all how it happened. The board members that we have are really committed to the fact that they're all our kids. And if we short anyone, we short ourselves because they end up in one of the bigger schools in fifth grade and another school in ninth grade because we have the middle schools and the high school. So the whole point was is that Bolton was in, at risk of closing. Bolton's expenses were through the roof. Decreasing enrollment is hitting all of us. How could we better educate everybody and care for everybody? So what we did was we implemented a program right off where we rotate our meetings in all the schools and each time we went to a school for the first time every year, we get a full tour of the facility. We hear about what's working, what isn't working. You can see visually, you know, this, this, this really needs some help. Wow, they really have, you know, enrichment up the wazoo. How are we gonna deal with that? So we've put a visual to that because not everybody knows what everybody else's schools look like. So we put a visual to it um, and have put you know, effort behind it in terms of having every building they do the same thing they did before. What are your priorities? Bring them forth to the budget committee, um, finance committee, put it all together, make sure that everybody has you know, what we need, the superintendent and the, um, and the finance officer weigh in on it. We haven't heard anyone say that they had any difficulty with any of that. Um, you know, the only thing in full disclosure was that the, the principal of the high school said, well, you know, in the old system, it was easy for me to move money because I need some new pianos this year. And now it's going to be a little harder for me to do that. I've got to go through another different process to get it. But we're going to get it because I know that they'll want to replace those pianos. I have a comment that may be able to end. You talked about Chet and East, a lot of the questions about Chet and East. The, the merger, the, actually just happened a year, so you have a full year's data and the results, okay. Yeah. We were actually, um, it's a year and a half now. So we were functioning, yeah, we, we were in November, and then we were functioning, um, all the other boards were defunct by July of this past year, 2015. So um, we've done two budgets actually merge, this one, because we, we voted in November of 14, so we did 15, but that was preparing for a head. But we all did it in a different way, though. And so, but the other, other boards still existed. Um, so this was the first one where the, you know, well, the other boards actually still existed, but they didn't do the budgeting. We, we did it all together. So you've saved $100,000 over two budgets? 
$166,000 in direct savings directed to the merger. How much did we save? How much are we down on our budget? We're 0.62 was the only increase we needed and we didn't cut jobs or programs. So I think that it, begin, it begins to get difficult to describe what can you attribute to the merger. And like I said, you don't even know what you can do until you have a different system to do it with. It's like all of a sudden you open it up and you say, oh, we can do X, Y, and Z. We can, we can make different things happen because we only have to go through this kind of a process. So we, like we moved our alternative program for the K through six, K through four group into a school as opposed to having it be a standalone. We've done, we're planning to do that with our um, five through 12 program as well. So we were paying rent and those kids were separated and isolated and now we can move them into a school. We can better utilize the school. We have that private preschool that's in our school and paying rent now because we had unused space. We're hoping to move the central office into the school, but that's gonna take some money for redesign, which can come from that transition fund. <laughs> Thank goodness. So that's kind of exciting to see that that might happen. Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, one of my questions already got answered, um, and I really appreciate your being on the spot sort of without meaning to, Dan, just standing up and talking about the, uh, a totally different district, which is really helpful, although, as you point out, it's only been a year and a half. So um, there's a whole lot of questions that haven't been answered yet, um, yet about what it looks like to be, you know, the uh, preferred model. Um, and uh, again, thank you for being on the spot. I am hoping at, uh, at some point that we'll be hearing from the, the study committee of this, uh, our schools, to hear um, their reflections on, on what they've uh, learned so far through the study process. And, and that's coming up in the presentation. Right. So if there was anything else, yes. And I can come back another time, or more prepared. <laughs> I'm going to assume that you're probably in favor, or at least neutral, about the transition. If someone from your district were standing up there and was opposed to it, what are some of the things that the opposing people might say? Great question. So Huntington opposed it, and so within our articles of agreement, which are published, you can see what they call a minority report. And it was the report that they gave to say that they did not agree with it. They had two Huntington representatives on the committee. One supported it and one did not. Most of the reasons that they cited in that report had to do with not enough time, not enough data to prove that this works, and we, we, could, have, we could have been in that committee for 10 years, and, and you're not gonna get data until you've done it for a certain amount of time. Um, concern that the bigger board um, would not take care of the, the younger, grades and the first thing we did was get universal preschool and not only that we got a grant for extended day so that all of our kids who are free and reduced lunch if they want a full day five days a week that can be given to them because we understand that that's an investment in our future children so um at any rate so what else would they say um their basic thoughts were fear that someone else would close their school so there was a fear, there was distrust, um, not enough data, and as we said to them, what, you're, if you're not happy with what you have now, if we're not getting everything we want now, you know, why not take a leap? Why not, why not trust in the creativity and, and the good people that you've sent are in your community to, to bring this forward and get something better? That's what they would say, and they've had three votes towards a merger. 19% voted for it the first time, 29 voted, 29% the second time, and this last round was 47% voted for it. So it's really close. Oh. I, you know, I, just, I want to you know, I applaud the effort to, you know, improve quality for kids, and I, I, but I have a lot of concern here in that these schools, you know, potentially have a great interest to the town itself, and, you know, economic interest and social interest in drawing people. And what I'd like to know, I've actually, I know the answer to this, I've asked it at the prior meeting, but 
I'd like to re-ask it, you know, if a given community wanted to, if they, let's take a Worcester or a Cowles, you know, when you've got a shrinking population, but that, they, that larger group, that, that the new board, which is weighted based on population, so that you can have a big imbalance of power, uh, within you know, a few towns can really govern decision making. I mean, can, would, if they decide to close a school because it makes sense to them financially, which in our situation here, that actually is going to probably be the case, we, uh, would that town have the ability, you know, would that town have the power to stop the closure of that school? And then, you know, that which may have really resounding impacts on property values, on even their ability to draw families. That's true, and Bolton is in that situation. Bolton was in the situation before we merged, they remain in that situation. They have the tiniest population around 70, maybe with pre-K, and so they are the smallest school. Um, they're definitely at risk. Never got that exit off the interstate. So Bolton is a struggling situation as well. At this point, what happens is, is you build in what you need to into your articles for what you want to do about school closures in the foreseeable future. And then you, um, you have to, um, again, understand that all the town's kids are all your responsibility. And I think that events will evolve and whether or not a particular school may close or not, it's not on our discussions right now. So I think we're all always at risk for that. And the other question would be is would we choose a different school? None of the schools are at their capacity, but there are three at the north end and three at the south end, and just because it's the smallest one doesn't mean that that would be the one that would close. It's all if it's all right, I'd like to move the presentation along. We can still, you can still ask any questions as we're going. We've still got a fair amount of stuff to go over. Um, that may generate some additional questions, or you still got a chance to ask questions. I'm not trying to shut that off, but I'd like to move on to some of the other information we have to share. Is that all right? I'll okay. look around after. Could you go back? I'm going to go back to the fourth slide yeah okay um, so we have more information through all this stuff presentations um, we've had a, the study committee's had a presentation on demographics and student learning we've had uh, a panel of eighth grade students um, from each town that shared um, their impressions of uh, their elementary school and the transition to middle school and how middle school is gone. And then there are special ed curriculum leadership team and some finance presentations. And uh, Emily is going to start um, with special services and curriculum. I'm, I'm not good at public speaking, but can you hear me? Is it on? Close. Um, so, talking about data, one of the things that um, we've been um, provided with during the course of these meetings are great presentations on, uh, by Kelly Bushy, the head of special services, Jen Miller Arsenault, our curriculum director, our leadership team, Lori Bebo, our finance director, and um, all of that stuff uh, in detail you can see on the ORCA presentations. So um, I was asked to create a, a two sentence uh, summary on special services and, and curriculum assessments and instruction, uh, which I've done and um, it's, it's pretty simple. And basically it just says that as far as special ed is concerned, um, our SU already provides administration and evaluation services, a behavior specialist to all of our schools. Only our paraeducators who deal one-to-one -one, uh, with students in the schools, any needed outside services that a student might require, and special equipment 
uh, that a student might need are budgeted at the individual school level. So um, what we learned from uh, the discussion with the special services director was talking about how sharing staff and sharing equipment would truly benefit the district. Uh, we did, at the end of the meeting, um, ask uh, for a little more data about whether uh, the cost and quality of special ed delivery uh, has been looked at and assessed by other districts who have already consolidated, and um, we're looking forward to hearing a little bit more about that. And then on the curriculum level, um, that was more about establishing alignment on the delivery of student learning outcomes across all of the schools. So there would be one set of grade level performance indicators that could be measured. Uh, one, right now, every one of our six schools has a continuous improvement plan that they have to work on and it has to be reported to the agency of education and ideally we should have one that's uh, district-wide and that would mean that all of our educators um, would share in the collective responsibility of you know our pre-k through 12 students and we feel that uh, or um, the presentation um, Im implied that this would promote equity throughout the, this, this supervisory union and it would better enable um, providing the resources all allocated based on student needs and that we would better be able to monitor the outcomes and uh, there would be accountability and measuring that could be reported on and that we could see. So talking about um, data, wanting more data, uh, what's been going on is at each of these meetings, we've had presentations by you know, curriculum, by special ed, by finance. And so you know, this is a learning process for all of us. And people with questions I think would really benefit by looking at those ORCA presentations and seeing exactly, you know, what we, the information that we've been given by the presenters. Well, Floor is going to talk through, and I want to interject just for a minute. I was we've, 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 this is a, a, probably a difficult part of the presentation because we've had these presentations but the study committee has not had an opportunity to reflect as a group. So the study committee doesn't, as a committee, doesn't have a response, doesn't have a, a, a common understanding of all the presentations. So we're, we're, uh, what they're trying to present is you know, what information we got. As the committee gets to reflect, we'll, we'll inform, um, we'll have informed decisions um, will decide how we felt about that presentation, how we valued it, how we judged it, but we haven't had that chance to reflect yet. So floor is going to talk on the leadership. Sure. See, we should we oh. take questions as we go along, I think. Uh, just a quick question. I've got a loud voice. Uh, am I hearing an acronym, ORCA or ORCA? Yes. Could you explain what that is? That's the um, television component. That's what we're being filmed right now. Um, and if you go to the Washington, you can go to the ORCA site and find it. The easiest way, I think, to find it is go to the Washington Central Supervisory Act 46 site, and there's a link there to the ORCA. So all the meetings are recorded, as are most of, I think, the school board. Thank you. 
so like Stephen said, I was just going to talk briefly about the leadership team. The leadership team came to talk to us at our past meeting, and we had been waiting to hear from them, so we were very excited. And the principals of each of our elementary schools and our high school discuss, discuss how a simpler governance structure might better serve the students. It, well, they also noted to us how they work together under the current structure, too. I'm going to stand up. It's getting late and can start to fade here if I don't. Um, so just a couple words on um, finance. Um, um, like Emily mentioned, we heard from, uh, at one of our study committee meetings, um, we heard from Lori Debo, our uh, director of finance uh, for the supervisory union. Um, and I, I think her presentation was consistent in a lot of ways with what we're hearing from Diane as far as ideas and concepts about um, some of the savings that could occur through uh, administrative and, and government, governance uh, efficiencies um, that could be achieved by going from um, essentially seven entities right now or six boards uh, and then the central office, um, each having their own uh, separate budgets and going to the, the model of uh, one board and one budget. Um, and just to, I think, to put a finer point on it, uh, some of the efficiencies uh, where we uh, would anticipate savings, at least at some level, I think that's one of the questions, is exactly how much uh, of a saving we'd be looking at. Um, but there are some kind of uh, ones we would naturally look at or anticipate, um, auditing services, bank account management, check processing for payroll, uh, benefits, uh, purchasing, um, and uh, payroll tax filings are kind of some of the areas where by going from you know, several entities to one, you would anticipate uh, some level of savings. Um, and other, some other possibilities that were talked about, um, sharing in physical plant uh, maintenance, and then also in uh, uh, food service sharing and, and purchasing. And to continue down this slide, um, it's in our charge that we're required to talk to outside districts. So outside districts mean towns outside of the five towns uh, that are in our current SU. Um, we've had discussions and meetings so far with Montpelier, with Twinfield, and with Roxbury. Twinfield and Montpelier, we've had two meetings. Uh, and all three of those met with the entire study committee on March 9th. That's on the video if you wanted to see them. Um, we've done some check-ins and we've conducted a community survey. So any questions about anything that's got to do with that slide? Any, yep. I have a, um, a concern or a question about some of the efficiencies that were just mentioned. Um, I know from just in my town, the people that do the work uh, put in a lot of time, oftentimes that isn't billable or is not billed. And so I feel like if the services get split between different schools, the job just becomes exponentially um, more demanding. And I think you lose some of that, especially with um, like food services at our school has a direct impact on the kids. They interact with them a lot. And I feel like if, if that job was shared between schools, it would become um, maybe more whitewashed and just become a much more demanding job than it already is. So I have concerns about sharing some of that staff between different schools. And I know it's it might be an issue for you know school nurses too. Working at two schools is more might be more than one job. You know, it's more like three jobs. Does that make sense? Okay. That's my main concern. And these are being recorded, and we'll get some answers. We don't have to everything. Um, so, with the outside districts, does Act Forty Six allow? Merging with Montpelier? 
Um, yeah, uh, it, 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 uh, Act 46 allows for outside districts to come in. It wouldn't have to be, it could be outside of Act 46. I mean, um, districts, towns can, uh, for those of you that are familiar with our district, we've, Montpelier and U32 have had multiple talks at different levels over many years. Um, so it's a logical, um, we virtually surround them, so it's, it's logical to have that discussion. Um, I think all three groups have been very frank and forward in um, what they currently see or what they might be currently interested in. Um, Roxbury is very interested in uh, joining RSU. They send a majority of their tuition, their seventh through 12th grade tuition. They have a pre-K through six. Majority of their tuition students already come to U32, so it's a, a logical choice for them. They're in a unique situation. They're small. They have 36 students in their elementary school. They have two and a half teachers. Um, and right now, they're completely alone. Um, the SU they were with is in negotiation. Northfield's negotiation in Williamstown are talking um, along with Washington and Orange of doing what's called a side-by-side. -side. Northfield, Williamstown would do pre-K through 12 and they would um, form one entity. Washington and Orange, which operate pre-K through eight would be their separate entity. They would operate side by side under one SU. Um, Roxbury originally was talking, was expecting to be able to join in with Washington and Orange, but because they're both pre-K through eight and Roxbury's only pre-K through six, they could not join that study committee. So they're now an isolated small school that's terrified that in a couple of years, the state's going to say, this is what you're doing. Um, so they're very interested um, in having an opportunity to merge with us. Twin Fields in the study um, committee uh, with Danville and Cabot. And they've been kind of frank and upright, forthright, that they're not 100% sure how that um, possible merger may go, so they're exploring what all their options may be. So they're interested in hearing where we're at. Um, they're not at the stage or the point where they're necessarily looking for anything, but you know, they're trying to do due do, do diligence to their community, so um, they want to know what the options are. Um, Montpelier, um, how are they summer? They're very happy with where they're at now. They, they like the way their system's working. Um, they, they think it's, uh, the, the pricing is pretty fair. They like the way they're set up. They're in a one school, one, uh, one board, one budget scenario. Uh, their pre-K is grade five through eight. They have no interest in changing that. Um, they still want a, pre, a middle school that was five through eight. Um, and they've been very upfront in saying um, they, they would be interested in continuing discussions, but if we're not in the same governance structure as them, um, one board, one budget, they wouldn't be interested in looking at any kind of a merger. So, yep. Yeah. So Diane noted that in the current preference, the, the current structure that we're under, the WCSU budget is not perfectly transparent. And I'm wondering if the finance reports, that's also something they consider in addition to the efficiencies you talked about? Well, under statute now, the way we're configured, the SU budget is approved by the full board. Uh, and it has to be approved before the town budgets are approved because the towns pay an assessment, is that the word I want to use? An assessment for some of the services. Um, so 
Um, I, I'll speak for East Montpelier, and East Montpelier board members, I think, will um, understand where I'm coming from, that at our town meetings, um, the SU budget frequently comes up, and, and there's a certain amount of dissatisfaction in the community that um, they don't get to participate in the decision of whether that um, budget is approved or not approved or changed. Um, so under a, um, one budget, um, everyone would be voting on, that would be part of the budget that you're voting on. So why don't you go ahead to the, yeah. Oh, okay, uh, so the next thing, uh, and I'll offer, this is statistics. So let me offer like a bazillion disclaimers. This is from the community survey that U32 uh, AP statistics class is doing a, a, a um, detailed analysis of the statistics. This is just some stuff uh, that I did, and Chantel's going to have some stuff in a minute. Um, but I mean, you can look at this from many ways. First of all, the response rate um, averaged about 5% across the SU. Um, so of registered voters, that's what I figured the 5% against, I think. I don't remember 100%. Um, but this is strictly from the initial report that, what was the survey tool? Uh, you mean the tool we used? Or yeah. We just used a tool that had scannable forms or online. Yeah. yeah. Um, so this is the data from this, it's preliminary, you know, it's not something to take to the bank, it's not 100%, this is where we're at uh, right now. And I only looked at three of the questions. One of the questions was, um, the way it was worded was like, uh, you, I think U32 provides a high quality education, or I think um, Doty provides a high quality education. So I had to modify the question a little bit so it would makes sense, so I just put provides a high quality uh, education. And for U32, 13% said they couldn't answer that. 78% agreed with that statement that U32 provides a high quality education, and 10% disagreed. For Berlin, 70% couldn't answer that. And the reason I suspect, I mean, in statistics there's correlations, but it, um, you, you can't know for sure, but this question was asked SU wide. So I think a lot of people that weren't in Berlin probably felt like they couldn't answer that. But 70% said they couldn't answer it. 23% agreed with that statement. 10% disagreed with it. In Callis, no comment, 66. Agree, 31. Disagree, 6. In East Montpelier, 58% couldn't answer. Agree with it, 37%, disagree, 5%. Middlesex, 56, 39, and 4. Worcester, 68, 25, and 7. Uh, the next question uh, is, so again, it was, is the school board in, and then U32 or East Montpelier? Um, I just shortened it. Is the school board doing a good job governing? U32 was 33%, 52 agreed, 16 disagreed. Berlin, 22%, 59 agreed, 19 disagreed. Callis, 15% couldn't answer, 69 agreed, 17 disagreed. East Montpelier, 17 didn't answer, 51% agreed, 29 disagreed. You can see the percentages on the last two. Just go to the last one, Bill. And the other question I, that was asked, is it important for each elementary school to have its own board? Across the entire SU, 13% couldn't answer, 45% agreed, 43% disagreed. In Berlin, 39% agreed with the statement, 51% disagreed with it. In Calais, 51% agreed with it, 39% disagreed with it. East Montpelier, 32% agreed, 48 disagreed, Middlesex, 48 and 39, Worcester, 66 and 31. So those were the three questions I looked at and I just um, 
pulled the data directly from the report. Chantal has more of a qualitative analysis. Thank you. Um, so I kind of offered to do this because I'm a number geek, and I uh, just decided that, I, sure, I can look at them and see what I see, but I didn't do a whole lot of math. Um, what I did was I um, wanted to do, I was more interested in patterns and kind of trends that I was seeing, and what I, what I saw pop out of me, at me right away was some outliers. So that's what I decided I was interested in. What, who are the outliers in this? And just full disclosure, the way I did this was I put the survey in front of me, the whole survey, the one that consolidated everybody's answers across the whole SU. And then we also had the surveys for every single town the same way. So there were six of them, and I laid them all out in front of me, and I moved page by page through the whole thing. I didn't see anything too surprising. Um, Really, what I saw was that our communities see things a lot the same way, um, which I found heartening, actually. Um, but there were some things that I found interesting. Um, the first question was, um, what, oh, I really hate that. Um, what are the important issues that you see, the most important issues that we're facing? Um, and for the most part, everybody said property taxes was a one. So they said that's pretty darn important, um, except for Worcester, I thought was interesting. Um, and I saw this over and over again for Worcester, that they didn't find, they weren't as concerned about taxes, they weren't as concerned about um, the cost of the school. They answered that one of three. Everybody else answered it a one. Um, social issues um, was kind of in the middle for most everybody except for Berlin, and Berlin found social issues to be an, a one. Um, Education was high. Uh, the importance of education was like one or two in all of them. Um, the order was basically Montpelier, Callis, Middlesex, Worcester, and Berlin um, was the least interested in education in terms of kind of related to the other things. So I saw, what I saw from that is that um, so social issues are something of, of a great concern um, for, for the town of Berlin. Yeah. Yeah, um, I saw that I actually, right, so, and I think some people didn't. As I read through these uh, two or three different times, I started thinking that I think some people had it backwards, yes. um, perhaps. So I think that might have been something we need to talk about, is it, how well we explain what the numbers mean, um, but one was supposed to be the most important, and six was the least important, which I think some people got backwards when I really looked more closely at the numbers. Um, yeah, Cindy. How many people from each town answered? Five percent. So, so how many people from Worcester? Like, was it five, It wasn't exactly five percent. No. <laughs> no, it was. A lot more from. Oh yeah. Um, yeah. Can you pull up the numbers? Um, Sorry, does she keeps going on? Yes, please. Yeah. So I mean, Berlin and East Montpelier are bigger. So 5% is a bigger number of people. It was really about 5% almost in every town. It was kind of weird. <laughs> I got turned out because it was very different numbers of people. But it was because the towns have very different populations. Um, so response totals by town. Berlin, 55. Callis, 62. East Montpelier, 102. Middlesex, 85. And Worcester, 35. Those are the actual numbers. Yeah. Um, okay, so then I moved to the next question, which was the most important issues involved in providing education. Um, again, I saw, it was really interesting, I kept seeing out, and, and please, I, this is not my opinion at all. This is just, this is just numbers that I saw. Um, so quality of education, um, 66% of people gave that a one as the most important, uh, very important. Um, Berlin was the lowest. Um, quality of education was 57% there. Worcester was the highest, again, at, at 74%. Um, cost, 
uh, 29% said cost was a one, although in Berlin it was 42%, in Worcester it was 14%. <laughs> so again, I just saw those two towns as outliers, and the trend that I saw, which is, was kind of interesting, um, was that Worcester is worried least about taxes and cost, and keep in mind this is 5% of the population, so, um, and taxes, and they care, they're the biggest outlier and liar in caring most about the quality of education. Um, Berlin, on the other hand, was just the opposite and worried more about the cost and less about the quality. And again, 5% of the population, so. Um, and then again, I said this before, but I saw in a few different questions that the social issues are a, a, a bigger concern in Berlin than in the other towns. So that was my qualitative analysis of the numbers. And for the actual percentages for each town, this is based off the registered voters in 2014. Um, so the number of respondents from Berlin, 55, represented 3% of the registered voters. Calus is 62, represented 5% of the relative uh, registered voters. East Montpelier is 102, represented 5% of the registered voters. Middlesex is 84, represented 6% of the registered voters. Worcester's 35, represented 5% of the registered voters. So um, pretty uniformly. Um, I think I speak loud enough. Uh, to me, this says a couple of things. First, 5%, we know it's not relevant, so it's small. But those outliers clearly showed us the different cultures in the different towns. And bringing those cultures together is what is going to be different. The other thing I want to comment on that is 3% of the registered, we don't even know who voted are registered voters. Correct, we do not. I, I, again, this is just information. Yeah, I think just expanding on what Dot just said there a little bit too. You know, it's, what I find interesting is the two, the two that are significantly different from the other three are also two of the schools that are going to probably carry the most power a significant portion of power on that board. So there is going to be, there is going to be some cultural clash there. There certainly is good potential. And there is financial incentive as well as cultural. You know, so I think this is not going to be a primrose walk. Which two are you referring well, to? Think yes, the Worcester Worcester I'm talking about, no, I'm talking about Berlin and <coughs> East Montpelier, Karen. They are very different. Worcester won't carry a lot of cloud. Callis won't carry a lot of cloud. Middlesex won't carry a lot of cloud. And we have Berlin and East Montpelier will carry a lot of cloud. And with the $8 million bond sitting in, in Montpelier, there is a lot of financial incentive to, you know, to have decisions to lighten that burden. I mean, I've heard that from a lot of people, including Tony Klein. So, you know, that's what it concerns me that the decision making is not going to be local enough. I mean, I think that the smaller communities are really not going to have much of a voice in this larger community or in this larger committee. And as we move forward with what our decisions may be, that will be part of what the discussion is. Um, it, it comes down a lot to trust and do we trust other people in our neighboring communities are doing not? I, I, I don't think that's entirely, a, it comes down to can you expect people to make irrational decisions in favor of something that another community might value over what the collective all values. So I, I don't think it's entirely that the concern is that it'll be each man for himself and you know if Worcester goes from having a fully represented board of one person. It's more when you take a look at the whole thing, how much of these little things that Worcester value actually matter when you're looking at the whole picture. So I think it, it's not just about trust. It's really about, it's a completely different analysis if what's important is the whole as opposed to the whole of just one town. And, and I don't disagree with that. Okay. 
So let's just go to the very last slide and then um, the study committee, we probably won't have much time to reflect this in our agenda. Um, if it's all right, I'm gonna allow opportunities for questions and comments from the community as long as we've got, and we'll just table anything else in our agenda if we have to, we don't have anything pressing there. Um, so next steps, we're having a presentation on April 13th on democratic civic engagement. That's probably the last major presentation that we'll, the study committee will have. We'll continue discussions with other districts. Um, we're gathering uh, feedback from teachers and staff. Today, we went to U32 in Berlin. We've been to Calais and East Montpelier and about this Wednesday, but the Wednesday after, we're meeting with uh, Doty and Romney. Um, just beyond the community survey, we're continuing, for instance, our forum tonight to gather community inputs and questions. Um, a governance model will have to be selected. If the governance model is different than what we're currently doing now, we'll have to agree on articles of agreement. Articles of agreement um, spell out what the governance entity would do. It covers things like who would be in that district, um, uh, how the board's configured, how um, um, debts and buildings are being handled, um, and, and some technical things like what you, what's the name of it gonna be, and things like that. So if we wanted to change our government's model, um, we would have to come up with articles of agreement. Uh, for instance, one of the article agreements frequently deals with school closures. Um, and then we need to prepare and present a report to the full board uh, on or before June 30th. That report can either be with a recommendation or it will be, we have not been able to reach a recommendation yet and we need um, further study. But on the 30th, we're required to report to the full board. Um, thanks for the uh, presentation. I've gone to a few meetings and uh, a couple of things just for feedback. What I'm struck by is uh, understanding what the impetus was for this Act 46 and the bill that was in the legislature the year before, how little information there is about the possibility of any financial tax benefits of doing this, other than a drop in the bucket in Chip Denise. And then secondly, uh, based on the 5%, and it's just 5%, and the feedback, which seems somewhat consistent in terms of the level of satisfaction, I'm again struck with, why would we do this? Why would we eliminate local school districts and abolish local school boards based on the information that's been presented? Because I see nothing that would justify doing that. So I think if we go forward, the committee ought to really think about when this comes time to a report and selling this to the five towns, if there's not any information about how this is actually gonna save tax dollars, and that seems to have been now put aside. Now it's about learning opportunities for children, but based on the information, I'm just not seeing anything that would convince me that eliminating local school boards and abolishing school districts would be worth a leap off a cliff. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to be mindful of letting everyone make their comments, uh, and we may spend a little less time on discussing them here, but I want everyone to be heard. I guess maybe this is the, the lawyer in me coming out. Um, how creative could it be? we be with articles of agreement in terms of could there be an article that says that any programmatic cut to a particular school could be vetoed by any of that school's representatives? Uh, that specific example might be too detailed. 
I don't know. We haven't, we haven't really. I don't think there's any limitation on what you can put, unless there's a, you know, there's, for you, um, the reason we would be doing this is because if we don't do it and there's nothing changed in the law, the leg legislature will do it, or the Board of Education, Agency of Education will do it for us. I mean, it's, there's not a option not to act, at least as the law is written now, as I understand it, and I'd love to be corrected if I'm wrong. Fair to say? I think the way it's fair to say is if we elect to do nothing, we need to be able to justify to the agency of education that we're fully meeting those five goals. And there's reason to suspect from the data that we've been shown we're not meeting some of those goals. So it puts us at risk if we do nothing, the agency of education will tell us what they think we will do. They'll tell us what they want us to do. Is that fair? Steven, Steven, Steven. Uh, I, I'll add to that, but I have something else I wanted to say. Um, I, I've been told directly by people from the Agen Agency of Education, as well as Rebecca Holcomb, that we would be told what we had to do if we chose not to do this. Um, I think it's only fair to share that information. It was a public uh, meeting that I had with them last summer. And, um, you know, if it, I, people are very concerned about local control, and I hear those words all the time, but to me, choosing to not do this is a choice that basically means we're handing the choice over to the state because they've told us that that's not a good choice for us. So it was pretty direct when that was said, and I think I just opened a can of worms. Um, but I also wanted to speak to the gentleman sitting next to Ruben. Um, I'm sorry, I didn't catch your name, but you said something about not getting compelling evidence in this talk. That's not what this talk was about. This talk was to tell everybody what we've heard, who we've heard from, what the information was about, um, if you want to actually hear the information to see if it was compelling or not, <laughs> the best way to do that is to go watch those ORCA videos of the meetings. And, I, and I've done that. Oh, you have? Okay. And I've gone to some of them. Okay. Yeah. Steve, and the Steve. legislature amended Act, Act 46 within no, six no. months of it being passed because of the reaction of those people in the state of Vermont. I sort, of, I sort of heard you. <laughs> well, but what I was saying was that if we don't do something, the state's going to tell us to do it. The law gets passed on July 1st, and on December 31st, there was already a bill in the legislature to get to modify the caps when people realized what was going on. So to sit, to think, the agency of education is going to come in and tell us what to do to hire people in the state of Vermont. I don't know if that's the best way to be making decisions because within seven months of the passage of Act 46, the legislature amended it in reaction to what people around the state. You're talking about the caps. The caps. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I couldn't agree less with you, Chantel. <clears throat> it's our job. These the legislators work for us. They made a mistake with this act. Maine made the same mistake. And their communities ended up in revolt, many of them. And they, you know, they broke out of the, they ended up making their consolidation law a voluntary after the fact. And, you know, 42% of the towns have dropped out of it already for, you know, the very reasons, you know, unaccountability, rise, rapid rising costs. For, you know, by, if we don't push back, I mean, I dare them to come in and vote something on us. I'll tell you what, I will personally, lead the revolt to get rid of Janet Adams, so get rid of Tony Klein in these communities, whoever it takes. And I think a lot of other people will do it. You know, that's what democracy is about. You don't roll over, when something bad happens, we don't sit there and say, oh no, you know, I have to do this because you're saying. This is bad law. And you know, I think we should be pushing back and vocally. I mean, there he's absolutely right, you know, that there have already been, there's been a lot of pressure on the House Ed and Senate Ed you know, that's what the cap the caps got rolled back and you know, this is this is just the beginning. You know, so I think if boards actually stand up and push back, they don't have the kahunas to take this on. I'll tell you, Janet and Holcomb are I don't care what they you know, they won't be in a job long if they don't. You know, I mean, 
um, while I, I do agree that there are some components of this law that are bad, there are several communities throughout the state that have gone very quickly to consolidate, and at that point, while it's bad, I don't know if we're gonna get a collective force throughout the state to overturn aspects of the law, so I just wanna point that out. I'm not taking the side, I'm just kind of trying to point the fact that several states have jumped on the chance to do this. I'm not saying it's good for our community, I'm just saying overall it would have to counter a lot of people throughout the state. Um, and kind of just in the articles of, of uh, agreement, um, I think that they are a fertile area uh, that we can work on and, and just, you know, create what we want to create, even though we're in the, maybe in the boundaries of Act 46, the Articles of Agreement are where we can, you know, create our governance and what it means, and uh, it can be detailed. Um, you know, I, I imagine that the, the agency of education would review it and maybe have some concerns, but I think we could do a lot of good things in that area, so that's, that's, you know, keep ideas coming. I think that that's really where, uh, if, if this is going to move forward, that's where uh, things can, can be created and established to maintain as much local influence and impact as we can. Laura? I think Chris took most of my lines out, but that's what I want to say. This, this meeting really was about a, you know, hearing from you, what is important for you, from you, you know, what do you value as a from your local schools and boards, and why do you not like want to lose, you know? And and also to understand that as a committee, we, we don't have consensus yet. We've been receiving all this information, and we don't have consensus among us exactly where we're where we're headed. But we do understand that every school is different, and and we really want to value that when we start to, you know, either do our terms of agreement, which. Is probably where we're headed, but that we're going to take everybody's equally value. Just as we formed this committee, we made sure that Dodi was represented uh, properly. So so please keep those, uh, you know, that, that input and that democracy part of our, our process so you can inform, you know, whatever decisions we can as we move forward. Do my best to have this not squeal horribly. Um, I have a couple of points that I want to make. One, my hugest frustration, both as a community and a board member with Act 46, is the expectation that was set by the legislature in setting it. It has nothing to do with saving money. Act 46 was done by the legislature because there's practically a revolt about property taxes, but Act 46 has damn near nothing to do with property taxes. And that's the bottom line. They had to do something, they did something, but what they did has nothing to do with the problem that they were charged with solving. Now, that said, I tend to be a fair class book, half full kind of guy, and I was on the Act 46 study committee going through the summer. And what I saw, aside from the baloney imposed on us by the legislature, is that I think there is actually genuine educational value for our communities and our kids at a bare minimum and very carefully exploring these options. So while the reasoning and the expectation, and this is also unfortunately the biggest hurdle that this committee is gonna to have to overcome, which is the taxpayer revolt, when we all have to come out and say, guess what? We think this might be a good thing to do, but there's no money to be saved in doing it. And that's something that I think we can lay very squarely at the feet of the legislature. Um, it's just they set a completely unrealistic and unfair expectation for what they were accomplishing with this act. All of that said, I've heard a lot of good things about the work that this committee is doing, and I really do believe that there's educational and community benefit that at a bare minimum we need to explore very carefully and with an open mind. Um, I just want to, I'm, I'm, well, I'm on the Adobe School Board, but I'm not on the um, study committee. I wanted to comment sort of along the lines of what Ann was saying um, about how there's a lot of, um, certainly the volunteers on the school board, but also the the school employees often go above and beyond and volunteer their own time um, to, to carry out what, what they're doing in, in the schools. And my concern is that while we're consolidating 
governance, we're also going to be professionalizing governance. And what I mean is that um, we're, we're not going to have those local volunteers at the at the town level, like building committees on school boards and the other volunteers. It's just not going to be the same buy-in when you've got one big board who can't possibly know the, the facility of, as well as each individual school board. And so you're going to have you're going to have layers hired at the top to to perform things like you know, having a buildings you know, facilities manager. Maybe that's a bad example because I know that we're trying to go in that direction anyway. Probably a good idea, but but um, you, you're gonna it, it's gonna be professionalized. These are gonna be hired people to do work that um, that volunteers used to do, and maybe that's one of the goals because, or maybe that's a maybe some people in this room think that's a good thing because the professionals will do it better. Um, but that's one of my concerns. And going towards the, the, the fear that Act 46 seems, seems to have brought out and well, we have to do something because the, the state's gonna do it to us later. I will note that the, those requirements in the law are, are years ahead, 2018, 2019, and the community, seems to me that the communities that have already merged under Act 46 were already those communities were already going down that road for, for one reason or another, like Chinden East, and we're going to have, you know, in, in, a, in another year, we're going to have a new, new governor, probably a new um, secretary of, of education, and not only that, but we're going to have another, but by those, by those dead, far out deadlines, we're going to have another election uh, for governor, and not only that, we're going to have two elections for governor. Before those deadlines happen, and so I'm just concerned that we're going to be the town, the the people in these towns are going to do something out of fear when we don't know what is going to happen down the road to these straggling communities, and it could become quite a political. Um, it could be moved into further up in the minds of, of the political thought in the state than it has been so far. It's not a big political football now; it doesn't seem to be anyway. But uh, as more towns resist it, it might become that. Um, so a couple of quick points, I hope. The, uh, the uncertainty regarding the legislative future of this, this law and whether the state could or would impose on Washington Central some uh, governance structure of its own devising if we choose not to act um, let's say that there's a 25% chance of that happening, of that really coming to pass. Um, how high does the level of discomfort and risk associated with that possibility have to be before we treat that 25% chance as a as relative certainty? And if it really has a one in four chance of coming to pass, I think the last thing I ever want to see is the state coming in and imposing its decisions on Washington Central for, for how it wants this uh, SU or this district to be to be run. Um, so I respect the argument that you know they're made the legislature's uncertain. We're going to have changes in politicians, but I still think there's a fair chance that this is going to be now. So we have to take it seriously as a, as a practical reality. Um, to the gentleman's point about the fact that there aren't really many financial savings uh, to be had, or at least no reductions in property taxes. I think that's probably true. Um, my hope or the, the conjecture or what we talk about with what, what inspires us with a bit of optimism, those of us who, who see it this way, is that what if we could do 20% more for our kids with the same amount of money that we're spending now? If we could do things with pre-K, if we could hire a facilities manager, a professional <coughs> facilities manager who actually would know the buildings inside and out and be able to respond quickly and in the moment to problems that arise. Um, so through efficiency, the kinds of efficiencies I think that Diane was describing, um, and many others, I think there's uh, potential to do uh, much better the students of Washington Central with the amount of money that we spend, even if we don't see um, a drop in our property taxes. I had one other thought, but I forgot it. So.
I just want to speak to the point about, um, you know, we better do something before the state does it to us. And I think it's ironic because we were not having the conversation about abolishing local school boards until the state told us to do it. So we are doing what the state is telling us to do. And one of my greatest frustrations about Act 46 is it doesn't say, hey, go and figure out how to achieve these goals in Act 46. It says, achieve these goals by eliminating your local boards and having one board, one budget, which is is not the same thing. I mean, I, I would be much happier if our goals were to achieve the things in the Act. Instead, it's do these things and how do you get rid of the local school boards and how do you still achieve those things? It's like the first step is sort of the carpet with the horse in my mind. I do want to point out that there is this opportunity to propose to the Department of Education that if we did it this way, we would be achieving these goals. Um, I think that we've heard in a public meeting somewhere that they're not interested, even though the law requires them to consider that, those sorts of suggestions. But that is something that is in the law, is making that kind of suggestion. We can get where you want us to go, but we would like to have local school boards still in the mix. I, I just want to say what I would think would be a more fair appraisal. I don't think the state is saying you, you must go, you must eliminate boards. The state's providing financial incentive if you do that, but it's also saying, you saw some of the, for instance, the layered model. Um, there's MUDs, there's RIS, there's other governance structures that don't require us to eliminate all our school boards. So they're not saying you must eliminate all your school boards, but they are providing a carrot with saying, if you decide to do this, um, we'll provide some financial incentive. So from the state side, I think that's... I remember my other point. That's <laughs> very exciting. Um, so I just wanted to address briefly the, the uh, concept that these five towns are culturally so differentiated from each other that combining them would cause a loss of cultural heritage or value, which we can't contemplate or something like that. I'm not sure if I'm stating that correctly, but um, it just seems to me that if these five towns in central Vermont which share 98% probably of their you know, cultural values, to be honest, can't come together in a common cause, then that's, that's depressing to me. Um, and in fact, we already have done it because we're sitting in a school that we already share and govern as a collective unit across the five towns. Um, you know, I'd also mentioned something I pointed to me before, which is that you know, there are people on this committee from Middlesex and East Montpelier and Berlin and Callis from Worcester, and there's not a person on this committee who wouldn't entrust my kid education. I have three kids in the system. And so that gives me sort of, it at least allows me the uh, possibility to think about a consolidated governance structure where I think uh, people could consider the needs of all students across uh, Washington Central uh, without bias and with their best interests in mind. Um, it doesn't seem to me like a far-fetched or crazy idea. Um, what seems like a far-fetched and crazy idea is that Berlin, Middlesex, and Worcester, and everyone else would go to war over some aspect of uh, future direction of the, the school. So maybe I'm naive about that. Yeah, I wanted to, oh, I wasn't going to speak to that, but I think I'm going to, because it was something I wanted to say before, and that is that working on this um, on this committee and, and working in the full board more in the last couple of years, what I have seen is a group of people who all just really care about kids. We, they all care about kids, and they all are great to work with, and they're smart people who are creative, and we don't sit and go, wait, where are you from? I'm going to sit over here. There's none of that. It's just, everybody's just on the board, and we work together for the kids. Um, so I have a really hard time seeing that as well. But the other thing, the thing I've really wanted to sit, been sitting here wanting to say is that um, we haven't talked a whole lot about the Articles of Agreement, and I think that it should be said that we can be really creative with these Articles of Agreement. And my hope is that by taking the bull by the horns and doing this together now proactively, 
that we can create some really great articles of agreement. Things like, Rick, you asked about closing a school. What if we made it so that it had to be unanimous and the town had to vote for it? Both. That's what I'm going to fight for. Um, what if we came up with some great local democracy kind of ideas, and I'd love to hear from Susan more on this, about using advisory committees within the school or something else local that could run and help to run or at least advise, be a, be a conduit from the community to the principal and the, and the faculty of the school that's more local and maybe even had a little bit more to say than just what we have to say, which is budget policy and student learning outcomes. That's all we do. So what if there were, we could create an advisory committee that could do more than that? And I know they're not voted on. They would be appointed. But we can do some creative things. And I'm hoping that by do, being very proactive with this, we can think outside of the box and we can use all these creative minds to come up with some really great things. Um, we, we still have a lot of work to do, um, and I, wanna, I hope we have uh, some good, detailed, and thorough discussion, because I actually think the committee has not had that yet. We've had presentations, um, but kind of like the discussion tonight, uh, we, we don't really know what will happen. You know, we have hypotheses, we have hopes, and I think we have some really fine hopes, um, and I agree with Matthew in terms of working together. I think we work together really well. Uh, and that, uh, you know, I don't think, you know, there'll be a disintegration of a board composed of all of our towns. I think I think we get along pretty well generally. Uh, but I, I also don't think we have very hard facts. Um, you know, it kind of um, dovetails with Act 46 originally being a cost savings measure uh, and then being transformed into an you know, equal opportunity measure. Um, and now hopefully the equal opportunity has essentially taken over. Um, but we really have dug into the information um, that we have. And I, I, I must say, I don't think we have very specific information about how this whole thing might work uh, in reality in tough situations. So I am hopeful that our group will discuss that in more detail um, in, in our remaining meetings. So uh, I would encourage everyone to come come out and you know, see anything on the ORCA presentations that you want to know more about, come and challenge us. Um, about well, what about this? What about that? But come to you know you need to come to our meetings to do that, um, which is uh, you know I, want, I don't want to say unfortunate, but we'd love to hear from you and come out because the orchid is a good source of information of what we've heard already. Uh, and if you hear something different than what we have, it'd be great to hear. Have a second, uh, multiple pair of ears. Um, so I, I would add um, to what Chris just said. Even if you can come to the meetings. Um, let your principal know, let the central office know, let a board member know. Um, the contact information for all the study committee members are, are on the website at the Act 46 uh, website at the central office. If you can't go and you have a concern, the first part of our agenda is public comments or comments that board members have received. So even if you can't be there and you want something addressed, you have a concern you want the board to hear, if you can't come, share it. Um, we, you know, we don't want to be exclusive. We want to hear what people have to say, and we're willing to be um, very flexible in how that information gets to us. So even if it's an email or a phone call or a letter, whatever it is, if you've got a concern and you can't come, please make sure that information gets out. I guess I want to put one other thought out there, which is I raised the issue of cuts being made. So, um, like at Romney, we have Spanish, and maybe the Articles of Confederation could have something like you need, <laughs> not Confederation, <laughs> like, <laughs> the Articles would uh, have something that says you need a unanimous vote before cutting programming. And then I would know that my three kids will continue to have Spanish at Romney. Um, but the other side of that is my oldest, my second creator, has never taken anything on computer programming. And 
I think she should. And I can talk with Brian and Chris and Lori and others. And we've got a majority of the Rummy board here <laughs> right now um, about adding that program. How would this consolidated board possibly add that program to all of the schools? So I would say at this point, it's a good question for the study committee to ponder. Um, I don't know. Well, it's nine o'clock, so um, it, it's something we need to talk about. It's uh, something we can explore what other um, districts have done and how they may have addressed adding things. Um, it, it's. I think it's just hard to put committee members on the spot and try to do something off the top of their heads. I can say from a biased point of view, my point of view, uh, what I'm looking for in the possibilities that could happen, and I think different people look at different possibilities. Um, I'm very distressed to see the cuts that are happening. Um, and I want to do everything I can to prevent more cuts and at least um, retain what we currently have for programs. Um, so for me, that's a, a strong motivator. And if if we can realize some small savings um, collectively, um, you know, that it was, maybe it was Chris that mentioned it or Matthew, if, if we can do 20% or 10% or 5% better with the current expenditure we've got now, then I think that's where we might be able to find uh, the opportunity to add some things in. But it's, it's a discussion the committee has to, to have, so we're aware of that. We're, we're going to wrap up here in a minute. Are there any more questions or comments? Um, we'll get Okay. Yeah, please. Well, that's why I put it up. So can you scroll to the bottom part of the state? So what this map represents is the current status of um, governance consolidation within the state right now. And at the bottom has the, the color code. So uh, the red one, the salmon one, that's what we were told the color was in Berlin today. Um, the salmon one were success, our successful votes to um, can to change. Not, it, not all of those are one board, one budget. They represent a change from what they previously did. The greens are um, districts, SUs, that are voting in April. The purples are voting in June. The yellow, and that's what uh, we're currently in, is a merger study committee. Um, and that's a formal committee that is required to make a recommendation. Again, as we've stated, the recommendation could be keep what we're doing. The recommendation could be one of the structures that you saw tonight. The recommendation could be a structure that none of us have yet envisioned. Um, the blue is the exploratory committee. That's a lower level committee where they're not tasked to make a recommendation. They're only looking at what options might be. And the grays are districts that are already in uh, one board, one budget. So for instance, what's this one? Springfield is already in um, one board, one budget. And the white ones, are not in any um, study committee right now. Uh, I mentioned Roxbury is uh, interested in wanting to um, have us explore letting them join our district. This district here is white because they're the ones that are in a uh, district with a New Hampshire school. Um, so uh, you want to scroll up? And it, so you can just see some of the different state ones. Um, we know the Northeast Kingdom one has decided to do nothing. And Stowe has decided to do, 
Should I say nothing, or they're looking at? They don't. I think that's who you talk to. Okay. Well, anyway, white ones mean they're not in any merger. They're not in any form of a merger discussion. So it's just presented as information. Once uh, April and June come, um, it'll give us more feedback on whether um, communities have voted to change their governance structure or not. Any last questions? Yep. Not a question. I just wanted to say that the next meeting is April 13th. Is that right? Yep. And we'll be talking about um, democracy and engagement, and that's one of the things I'm excited about. So if anybody's interested in that, I want to come on April 13th. Thanks, Susan. Okay. Um, I'm not telling people they need to leave, but um, I'm going to adjourn the uh, Act 46 Study Committee meeting by consensus at 9.04.